So this is week four, television and radio programming. And we'll, uh, since we gave a sizable portion of last class to uh, uh, reviewing for the quiz, we'll probably be uh, still on week four a little bit next week, which is fine. Um, we have time for this, a very important topic, where we actually talk about the content historically of radio and television and also how the content is still packaged and distributed today. So, you know, in later weeks, we'll look at the business about how advertising sales are made and stuff like that. But today we're looking at content. Um, so what do you think is one of the most important determinants of what content goes on the radio or TV? In other words, we know there are executives and creative people producing that content, but who are they serving with that content and, and how do they know uh, what to give? Yeah. I think it's um, two ways. First of all, they are serving the uh, audience, people who are watching and listening, but at the same time as the advertisers. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I even have a little diagram. I don't know if I've drawn it up already, but you know, the structure of old school broadcasting would, you know, if, if the audience is being served Primarily, uh, we have, you know, the content producers like networks and we have advertisers. And uh, this has been, you know, for uh, 70 years or more, the structure of economic structure of the business. So the audience is there to consume programmers, programming, advertisers want to reach the audience. And so they pay to be uh, on the networks, the networks produce the content. So it all kind of fits together with, with ratings as being a very key part of how we understand what audiences want. So there's ratings, which is a form of research where you know, we monitor what the audience is consuming and give them more if they like it. And if they don't, if they don't tune in, we give them less. Um, so in this chapter, uh, we deal with both radio and television. Um, and I may jump rather quickly through radio perhaps today. Uh, but um, uh, whoops, that's not, we don't want the quiz. All right, fantastic, thanks. We want the lecture slides. Uh. So ra what we know about radio was that it was our original electronic mass medium uh, and um, you know through through especially through the 1930s and 40s uh, did you want to write the quiz or did you write it already, I already did it. you already did it okay great thanks for coming in awesome so uh, uh, in the between the 20s and 40s all of the radio programming genres emerged uh, you can listen to a lot of them on YouTube. There's great compilations of old, old school radio dramas. And we listened to a little bit of The War of the Worlds, which is a very famous one because it had such an impact on its audience. Uh, but th day to day, there was an enormous you know, number of programs. The first soap operas were on radio. Uh, uh, there were other dramas and such. Lots of comedies were there. Uh, the notoriously racist Amos and Andy, which was a show originally on the radio. It was two white comedians pretending to, you know, pr producing the worst stereotypes of, of black people. Uh, that even moved over to television eventually and had uh, a successful run on television. So that, that show, you know, kind of a blackface minstrel show throwback was on the air for 25 years. Uh, but you may recognize some of the names of these other classic comedians. And so they were successful on radio, and many of them began in vaudeville, uh, moved over to radio, and then eventually finished their careers on television. So uh, they moved a lot. Now, we do remember that when television came up and became the dominant electronic medium in the 19, late 1940s, early 50s, Radio was left without a lot of content options because most of the stars moved over to television. Most of those successful programs, like for instance, a police show called Dragnet. I don't know if you heard about it, but Dragnet started on radio and then moved over to television. So radio kind of found itself without 
uh, uh, much of its original programming, and it transformed itself into an outlet for music. Um, in addition to that, you know, there was a boom in popular music consumption amongst young people. Rock and roll, that brought people to radio, and as we saw, there were so many people flocking to radio that FM radio became viable as well when it was playing music. So get to today, and we can break down the types of radio programs that exist right now. And always uh, uh, remembering that new forms of music distribution have appeared, you know, your streaming services like Spotify or Apple Music, which have challenged radio as, you know, the, the outlet for, for music. Uh, however, radio still hangs on, and as we said, it's trying to uh, main, maintain a certain uh, 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 relevance, especially in the car or on the on the road, you know, outside of the home. Um, but again, smartphones may be challenging that. So the types of radio programs, um, news and information on AM radio, where the uh, sound quality isn't that great, but the coverage is very powerful. Uh, is very popular. If you look in uh, for the radio ratings in San Francisco area, the top rated shows are always on AM. They're all news or, or uh, news and talk like KGO. Um, so these are still very relevant, a very profitable types of programming. Talk shows, information shows, you know, the shows with brief little news items and drive information and stuff are very important. Uh, we have a healthy non-commercial radio uh, presence here. We've got, uh, of course, the NPR affiliate stations, KLW, KQED. Uh, in the East Bay, we've got KPFA, which is part of the Pacifica network, which is a 60, 70-year-old progressive network, um, which is also public radio. So you may have noticed that the frequencies for public radio are 88.5, 91.7, so that's a legacy of you know the 1960s when uh, you know frequency allocations were set aside and uh, they said well we're going to keep the lower part of the band for educational and public radio so we still have those and KLW I think is uh, more than 50 years old as a station uh, now of course they make their money as we said through sponsorships and uh, uh, you know donations versus. These other stations uh, make their money through advertisements, right? Uh, so if we look at music radio, those are the top 10 formats in 2013. Uh, I don't think it's changed all that much. And I just downloaded a report from Nielsen, which tracks this kind of thing. Whoops, I guess I got to get out of the full screen to see that. So uh, if you want to check this out because you're interested, um, look up. Uh, audio today so this is a quarterly report from Nielsen which you know you all know Nielsen does the television ratings they also do radio and podcasts so look at that they no longer say radio today which they used to it's audio today so uh, um, this is just a tip of the iceberg of all the marketing information uh, that exists out there um, and this is what they give away to us free but uh, many uh, if you're, in the, if you're in the business, you have to subscribe to get rated, and uh, we'll talk more about that when we have a week about ratings as well. But if we look at this, you know, ranked by share of total listening percentage, so you can see. So this would be across America of the radio audience that still exists, the people who tune in. What are they listening to? So top is country music, followed by news talk. We talked about those. <laughs> news talk. <laughs> More news talk, adult contemporary. So this, in our market, would be something like uh, KOIT or something, sort of like uh, ballads and so popular music. But you know, why why do you think that would rate high? Who do you think is listening to that type of stuff? Sort of soft popular music. Why would that rate high? Do you think? I think people are eagerly tuning into that because that's department stores. Department stores, you know, in the background at your work or something like that, right? It doesn't interrupt. It's a nice kind of you know comforting sound in the background. That's exactly why. KOIT, for instance, starts doing uh, Christmas music on December 1st, you know, like a, a week before anybody else does. And they always rate pretty high for that, too. So because a lot of this is background music and such. And 
So you can go down there, classic rock, only 5.9% 5 of the audience listens to that, but you know, what demographic do you think listens to classic rock? Young people, old people? Mostly older people. Mostly older people. You know, those of you, maybe you got, you know, Sweet Emotion by Aerosmith is just an example they give. But, you know, maybe you were growing up like me and that was on the radio and you still want to hear that music. So, so that gives us a hint as to why there are all of these different uh, uh, genres of music, you know, and how you can say, well, this would be KOIT. This would be KCBS or KGO. Uh, you know, The Wolf was uh, kind of a country brand that was present here. Intercom had a station like that. I don't know if it's still on the dial there. You know, there's at least three classic rock stations or KFOG in our environment would be one of those probably. And so on and so forth. So uh, each of these formats attracts particular audiences. Old guys, you know, uh, people at work, uh, people who need to get to work and so on. Uh, 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 so the audiences are very carefully studied and these genres of music are kind of pulled together to, in order to attract special particular audiences for advertisers. You know? So uh, if you want to reach older people, you put your ads on a station which the music attracts older people. If you want to you know, hit everybody, one of these stations is probably your best bet, at least everyone who will be driving, you know, and so on and so forth. If you want to hit Spanish speakers, you know, go there, right? And so that's, that's the, the whole logic of differentiation, uh, which draws particular audiences, and that's what, you know, that's what people sell to advertisers. So uh, the content is, you know, created for that reason. Um, so there's a few of the other, uh, uh, you know, these are, these are uh, industry standard genres. Um, there are many more than these. The industry is constantly creating new ones, new formats, that's what they call these. So, uh, but the, the main ones uh, stay pretty stable because they attract particular audiences. New formats are created by consultants usually, and stations will try them out. If they're successful in one market, maybe another market will see, oh, what is that thing uh, that they're doing there? Uh, let's try that. And so then you, know, you start getting many stations across the country using a new format. So there's no central office of format creation. It kind of is usually driven by professionals from the radio industry who become consultants and go to different stations around the country saying, well, you know, your station's not that profitable. I have a new formula that might work, a new format for you. you know? So that's it. Uh, a lot of radio, music radio, local programming, right? That's a, you know, a KOIT. It's somebody in San Francisco decides what to put on the air. Um, there's also a category of programs which are, you know, they come from the network. So, for instance, CBS has a radio news network. Uh, so if you listen to KCBS here in San Francisco, you'll hear a lot of stories that come from the case, you know, the CBS radio network, in addition to some local items. Um, there's also syndicated programming, which means there are private companies which produce radio shows that they will sell. For instance, Rush Limbaugh, have you ever heard of Lush, Rush Limbaugh? A conservative talk radio host, he has his own uh, 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 production company. They produce Rush Limbaugh's show, which is sold in you know, hundreds and hundreds of radio stations across, across the United States. Um, we have one in the Bay Area that produces a show called House of Blues, which is very popular. So a lot of uh, radio students intern over there. So that's a, a show which uh, you know, has blues music on it and uh, uh, contracts with celebrity Dan Aykroyd, who used to be one of the Blues Brothers. He you know, sits in Los Angeles, probably in his basement, and records the, you know, the talk between the songs and sends it up to San Francisco. And someone here packages the show, and then they sell it to you know, tons of stations across America. So that's the idea of a, a, a syndicated show. It's, you know, in, in both cases, the program is created in one place and distributed, either through the network system, as it still exists in radio, 
or syndicators sell you know, on a station by station basis. And those shows will usually come on Saturdays. Uh, Ryan Seacrest does America's Top 40. That's a syndicated show, so his company will produce it and then they'll sell it everywhere. And because you know, most local stations, you know, people listen to that show, but they don't want to have someone in their own version of Ryan Seacrest. So it's cheaper for them to buy the show from Ryan Seacrest and put it on their radio. So that's what syndication means. Syndication means that a private company makes the show and then sells it all across the country, usually delivered by satellite now. Okay, um, so uh, if you're in a local station and you are, you know, organizing what goes out on the air, you use something that they call a hot clock. Uh, the hot clock represents one hour of program. So this is the morning drive hot clock. So, you know, this would be, let's say, from... 8 to 9 a.m. and this would represent an hour of programming like 8 to 9 a.m. and then this would be it says evening hot clock so let's say this would be you know 8 to 9 p.m. if you want and uh, it you know represents what goes in there so it's kind of like a template imagine that and the template will stay the same every day of the week from 8 to 9 a.m. for this one and you see it's got spots for music so a computer or a program director controlling a computer will drop in specific songs into these spots in the template. They will vary, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little. Uh, then, you know, so we know that there will always be three songs. We don't exactly know what they will be, but there will always be three songs. And then they'll talk about traffic, you know, traffic on the eights. We do it at you know, 8.08, and we'll do it again at 8.28, and we'll do it again at 8. Uh, so uh, they do that. And then there'll be a burst of commercials, because you've got to put them in somewhere. And then there'll be a promo for either something the station is doing or maybe something that's coming up a little later. And then there'll be music, a couple of songs. They call this a sweeper. So three, three songs up here, but two songs down here. Again, we don't know exactly what those songs are, because it will be determined by what's called a rotation, right? So the music programmer will have a whole list of songs. Usually there uh, are, you know, again, those are market researched. So, you know, publications like Billboard will track, you know, the number of plays of a song across the nation. And they will know, wow, that new Beyonce song is really, really successful. So it will go on a list and uh, the computer will rotate those. So. What do we call a song that is played very often? The same song played very often? I'm sure you've heard of it. Heavy rotation, right? Heavy rotation, right? So, so a song that's in heavy rotation will come up very often by the computer and will get plugged in there. So uh, uh, this is called a hot clock. So remember that. And it, it represents an hour. And it's, it's like a template. So, you know, if you do drive to work or something like that so that you're usually, uh, you know, listening to the radio at a particular time every day, you will recognize, it's, you know, just the structure of the day. So every radio station does it a little differently. They'll have a different clock. And, uh, you know, depending on the type of music they play, they'll fit stuff in. Uh, there are different categories. Uh, there's a category called gold, which is like old songs, but that are still loved. And there's maybe a couple, yeah, a couple hundred songs that are classified as gold. So sometimes you'll see in a hot clock, you know, it's not just generic music, but they might say gold or, you know, hot, hot 100 or gold or something like that that specifies what kind of music will go in there. Um, there are some tricks, tricks of programming here, because this is all designed to get your audience, right? Uh, so they th they're thinking about, uh, for instance, when they lay out a hot clock like that, they're saying, most people got to get to work by 8.30. That means, you know, the average drive time in this area is probably 40 minutes. God help us, but that's, you know, probably what people are facing. Uh, so they know that, okay, my, my listeners getting to work around here, Wind this back at 40 minutes. They get in the car. What are they going to hear? They're going to hear some music probably and then three commercials. I risk losing them during my three commercials 
But we're coming up on the top of the hour with news and traffic, so people are probably going to sit through the commercials waiting to hear the traffic report and stuff like that. We hit the top of the hour. It's 8 AM. We know they're in the car. They get their news or whatever. Well, they got their commercials here. They got their traffic here. Now we're going to give them three songs. We're going to make sure that they're really popular songs so they stay with us. So we'll use our best popular songs. Then we got a traffic update coming there. And then we get the dangerous section again with three commercials. But we can hit them with a promo, which is like maybe for a competition. You know, and we'll say, stay tuned at 8.50, 8.25, we're going to tell, you know, we're going to ask the question of the week and you could win a thousand dollars, you know, or win a chance to win a thousand dollars because they usually don't give you a thousand bucks, they put you on a list, you know. So they're just trying to keep you going and staying with them as long as they possibly can. And they're thinking about what, you know, during the morning drive, they're imagining that you're in the car and what do you want to hear and when do you get to work and stuff like that. In the evening, it's a lot less competitive because most people are watching TV or doing something else. And so, you know, they'll play a lot of music here. They put five commercials in a row because, you know, you're probably just listening on background or something. So there's all kinds of considerations as to what the audience wants and what they're doing at the time that goes into setting up a hot clock like this, you know? Uh, and as you can see, it's, a, it's, a, it's an established template, but there's variations of the music that are in it. So, uh, uh, you know, this is called a hot clock. Uh, a, a song that shows up a lot within the uh, program is called uh, heavy rotation when you, you play the song a lot. Um, all right, so now we're getting into, <laughs> that's real fast, just the information we needed to know about radio. We can spend a little more time on TV programs and such because it, I mean, it's just so interesting what we got today. So, uh, um, you know, TV, as we know, comes on the air commercially in the late 1940s. There was the freeze. And so really television as we, you know, modern broadcast TV is a thing of the 1950s. Um, in the early days, late 40s, a lot of shows uh, were, um, uh, you know, uh, they were experimenting. So they would have uh, uh, live broadcasts of Broadway shows, uh, dramas and stuff. They, they would um, televise short plays and stuff. So they had not yet settled on exactly what the uh, program genres and formats were that were going to work for television. So we can break down those, you know, the types of shows that were created into, you know, narrative or non-narrative. Narrative meaning dealing with fictional characters, so your dramas, your comedies and stuff. Non-narrative programs, which would be documentaries or, of course, talk shows and now hugely popular reality shows uh, when you get to the 1990s. Game shows, which are still on, a staple of daytime TV, sports and news, which are really what keep people tuning into broadcast television now, uh, that they can see you know, all kinds of uh, stuff through streaming services in a non-synchronous fashion. So as we said, a lot of the early television formats and shows and stars came over from radio. So there were established radio shows that were successful, and they you know, reinvented them for television often with the same stars if they, you know, had the televisual look that was necessary. So what did they have? You know, they had anthologies like The Twilight Zone. Uh, they had dramas, serials like soap operas especially were really big on television. Situation comedies, so we've got, you know, a lot of those. Movies and miniseries, uh, which, you know, sometimes they would put a movie on. You know, there's, there's a lot of this stuff on YouTube. Particularly, there's a series, you know, top 10 decade defining shows of the 50s, of the 60s, and so on. So we don't have a time to watch a lot of it. But uh, there was a, a lot of shows that were... Welcome to WatchMojo.com. And today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 <laughs> decade defining TV shows of the 1950s. Now, with two heads, it occurs to me, 
I can think more clearly than with three. For our series on the top decade-defining shows per era, we picked series that spoke to the period in which they were made and set the standard for television during that time. No, not me. I'm not in your league. These shows were chosen for how important they were in the 1950s, regardless of when they started or finished. You know how it is. <laughs> Number 10, Father Knows Best. I'm worried. So am I. I don't know which is gonna go first, the ceiling or my nerves. <laughs> Those who really know best can't get enough of this show. I can use it. The hilarious sitcom portrays middle-class Midwestern life by focusing on the Andersons. Hello, brother. <laughs> A lovable family who is the ideal American clan. Where are the children? Kathy's next door. Betty's at a sorority meeting and Bud's upstairs. Ah, uh, quiet evening at home. As children Betty and Bud grew up and graduated from high school, their parents tried to give them advice. I think it's time you and I had a little talk. The show was so ingrained in U.S. pop culture that the Treasury Department commissioned a propaganda episode, which never aired. You sure there's no other catch to this? <laughs> no, that's all. As with many 50 shows, it started out on radio, but it made the transition well and gained even more fans. You can have a barrel of it, but it's not much good unless you work for it. Number nine, Lassie. To young Jeff Miller, I leave the best thing I've got. My dog, Lassie. She's all yours, son. This drama ran for a whopping 19 seasons, but its best years were the early ones, when it was still in black and white. Why in tarnation didn't you say so in the first place? The plots were often similar. One of the boys would get in trouble, and the titular collie would save him. Sassy, listen to me. Go to the Brockways. Take this to the Brockways. Go to Porky's, Lassie. To Porky's. Go, Lassie. Run! The stories were fairly simple, but they were entertaining and provided valuable moral lessons for their young viewers. Huh? That's why she barked. It's a bear track. Winning two Emmy Awards in its early years and consistently winning its time slot, this series is a feel-good classic from the early days of television. <laughs> Number eight, The Ed Sullivan Show. There was a lot of incredible music in the 1950s, and much of the public got their first exposure to artists through their appearances on this variety show. As these youngsters from Liverpool, England, and their conduct over here not only as fine professional singers, but as a group of fine youngsters. The series showcased performers ranging from Itzhak Perlman to Elvis Presley, and it became appointment viewing for families across the U.S. No matter who was on, Sullivan was a gracious and charismatic host, and that's how his show lasted a spectacular 24 seasons, remaining relevant all the way through. Number seven, the... Uh, yeah, yeah. So what are your impressions of, I mean, you know, we, we could watch more, but how does that reflect America as we think of it in the 1950s, those shows? What, 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 what are you getting out of American culture looking at that? Yeah, Katrina? And maybe the answer to the show, it shows the uh, family values. Like there is a big family, they live together, how they communicate with each other. Right, and the wife was very subservient to the father, and the father was sort of this fountain of knowledge that was going to educate the kids, and definitely. So there was kind of a very, you know, an emphasis on these uh, sort of patriarchal family structure and stuff, father knows best. Uh, now, how about uh, Ed Sullivan? Elvis. What kind of impact do you think Elvis would have had in a culture where, you know, uh, that that family and that the, that set of relationships was, you know, considered something so valuable? When Elvis appears, what, what does that do? The Beatles, those things, rock and roll. Is it liberating women in a way? Like, because right now it's their time to watch TV? Uh, it is is possible, but I mean, it's certainly liberating in a sense from you know the moral blanket of uh, father knows best to, uh, but Elvis 
rocks. You know what I mean? It's kind of, I don't want to. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth or anything. But and maybe this isn't the course where we have a chance to really dip into that. But you know, Elvis. Uh, they filmed him from the waist up because you know he used to dance like this, and they felt that that was too provocative. You know. And the girls screaming in the audience, well, if you watched, you know, the Beatles documentaries, which is from the early 60s and stuff, but they couldn't even hear themselves play because there was like 100,000 screaming kids in, in, in Shea Stadium. So the audience was so loud they couldn't hear themselves. So, you know, I, 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 it's just, if we're looking at what was popular on TV, it was both, you know, really kind of moral, moral teachings, like Lassie is trying to teach you how to save people and take care of people. And, stuff or father knows best obey dad to you know the whole kind of youth youth culture explosion and and how transgressive that was supposed to be at the time in other words how how naughty elvis was and how how that you know appealed to people's passions and things like that so so you, you know but in terms of program genres we've got you know westerns which came out of the you know b movie tradition but, so they are on TV. We've got detective shows. We've got you know family dramas like Father Knows Best. And is there any popular family dramas on TV nowadays that you're aware of? There's a show called This Is Us. Anyone seen it or heard of it? Maybe your parents watch it or something. I don't know. This Is Us, like it's kind of like a three you know a interconnected family hour long drama that's currently really, really popular and stuff. Uh, we don't have any many Westerns, but people take a shot at it. Uh, so detective shows, uh, and, you know, we could go through the reel, but there's a lot that's still out. I know there was a movie remake of The Lone Ranger. There's been movie remakes of a lot of these shows because they do this. Uh, there's Raymond Burr in there, so uh, who was, you know, a detective. There's uh, Right? There's Hitchcock, which is this anthology show. It will only make appearances. Which featured tales of... So, you know, we have things like uh, Black Mirror now on Netflix, of course, but it's just, you know, kind of creepy, surreal story. Every, every uh, episode casts that change. So a lot of these are, you know, and we've got the Honeymooners, so, you know, situation... <laughs> Meanwhile, situation comedies about you know couples and families, and so yeah, I mean now one of the biggest shows that's just going off the air, The Big Bang Theory, uh, is you know straight out of this stuff, you know, and and they're even produced the same way, you know, with, with the same production techniques. So these are you know we could if you had we had tons of time, it would actually be really fun to look you know decade by decade at the television shows that were so popular, what they kind of tell us about American society at the time. And, uh, uh, another thing which is pretty big, is it, has anyone seen the movie called Quiz Show? No, it's a Robert Redford produced film about a scandal that happened in the 1950s regarding uh, the very popular genre of uh, quiz shows, which you know, a lot of TV, it was, that was something that was easy to produce live you know, in the studio in New York, you'd have contestants in, you'd ask them questions. Uh, but it turns out that the Good answers evening. were I'm rigged. Good evening. I'm Jack Barry. The show Tonight, Hank Bloomgarden, who has so far won $116,000, will play a fourth tie game against Harold Craig at $2,000 a point. In the 1950s, quiz shows were the kings of primetime television. Yes, the $64,000 question. Eleanor, what's the word beginning with a Y that names a fermented milk food? Isn't that $2,500 a point? The category is boxing. High pressure with big stakes. Much could be won or lost in just a matter of moments. A recipe that drew in millions of viewers every night. From New York City, Mr. Charles Van Doren, and returning with $69,500 from Forest Hills, New York, Mr. Herbert Stemple. So uh, you can see, like front and center, the advertisers. You know, these are so. This was in the days when they hadn't yet figured out the 60-second television spot. So shows would have sponsors, and they would, you know, and their name would be all over the show. And Geritol was, a, I think, it was a mouthwash or something at the time. So this is the one that kind of blew the lid off the the whole. Uh, genre and the you know the goings on there, uh, basically Stemple, uh, um, 
already at sort of $21,000 on the $64,000 question, uh, gets a new contestant, Charles Van Doren, who's a Columbia University professor, as you can see, taller, more handsome, really well spoken, and you know, with a job that makes him out to be an intellectual. He, is, the show finds out that he rates really, really well, and they basically fix it. So they give him the answers to the questions so that he can win, ultimately, because they find out it'll be better for ratings that he wins rather than Stemple, who's you know, not as telegenic and such. Uh, Stemple you know, was not a, aware of this, but suspected it. And uh, that starts you know, talking, which leads to an investigation. Eventually, Congress calls the producers of this show, 21, and the $64,000 question, and, and many other shows, and you know, has them under oath confessing that, yes, they did give answers to the questions to the contestants that they felt would rate better with audiences. Uh, Van Doren himself is called and, and you know, in, in like a dramatic moment, basically confesses. Uh, so it's a huge, huge scandal. Uh, which you know leads to uh, uh, this type of show, you know, goes off for a while, and uh, when it comes back, there are still special rules for contests that are on broadcast, either radio or TV. So you know, the, you, there are rules such as you must actually give the prize that you say you're going to give, uh, and so on and so forth. So there, there's actually special rules for this type of broadcast content, based on. Um, you know, the fact that this happened in the 50s. So as I said, there's a really, there's a very dramatic movie uh, version of this called Quiz Show, which uh, you, maybe you can find it on a streaming service or something. Very entertaining and a great, a great recreation of 1950s America when all of this was going on. So anyway, we're, I think we're over time now. So uh, n next week we'll come, you know, talk about programming strategies as they work in TV, all right? So uh, have a good weekend, and next week we'll start talking about our, our next assignment.